Hi everybody, my name is Rod Escaiola and I'm your condominium lawyer with Gowling WLG. Welcome to uh, episode 15 of our series. Folks, tonight is the last episode of the season that we've decided that uh, and wait till you see the cliffhanger we have for you. Believe it or not, Toronto is about to reopen. In fact, it's reopened today. So that's going to keep you on the edge of your seat uh, for the summer. Let's see how well they fare. Hopefully, uh, well, actually. Now, in today's uh, episode, we're going to give you an update about uh, reopening Ontario with a bit of a focus on Toronto. We're going to recap on the COVID protocols. Uh, if you're going to reopen your amenities, we're gonna sort of uh, clarify some uh, misunderstanding that uh, I, I think it's wishful thinking. People may have heard what something different than what we actually said with respect to that, but we'll, we'll reiterate it. Uh, then we'll focus on condominium insurance and we have a special guest tonight uh, to help us with this. As time permits, we'll also take some questions from the floor if, if time permits. Now, tonight being the last episode, uh, you will recognize most of our usual cast of characters. And this being uh, the season finale, I thought that I would pick game shows as tonight's theme to introduce them. Let's see how that goes. So from Apollo Property Management, uh, half mediator, half enforcer, knowing how to keep the feud out of the families. We have Sean Cornish. Hi, Sean. Uh, hey, Rod. How are you doing? Good, good. <laughs> I, I got nothing me. after that. <laughs> and uh, from Crossbridge, speaking on behalf of VACMO, trying to balance corporations' interests and owners' desires, we have Catherine. Let's make a deal. Gao. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, knowing when to buy vowels and when to solve the puzzle from Lash Condo Law, spinning the wheel of fortune, we have Denise Lash. Hi, Denise. Hey, Rod. Hello, everyone. And our two condo twins. Uh, well, actually, gee, we're missing one of the twins. He's going to join us later. He's on the line right now with a local judge here. He's not in trouble. Don't worry about it. But uh, so I guess I'm going to skip Graham for now. But uh, we have uh, next in line then, I guess, from Gowling WLG, knowing when to bid $1. Come on down, David Plotkin. Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, finally, from the National Life Safety Group, keeping everyone safe with an eye out for the weakest link, we have Jason Reed. Hi, Jason. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Rod. Hi. I'm glad you could join us. We were having technical problems, but uh, thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have the chat channel is uh, going. Uh, it's live and well. This is great. Keep uh, keep chatting. We have uh, good people out there. I see um, I see some of the usuals, so that's great. Uh, if you want your question to be specifically ignored, make sure you put in the question and answers. No, no. If you want your question to come to our attention and you want it to be sort of above the fray of the chat channel, put it in the Q and A. But we're going to try to see if we can uh, uh, manage both channels. As usual, we're going to start with our disclaimer. I know it's your favorite part. Keep in mind that, especially for our good friend from Winnipeg, keep in mind that when we refer to legislation tonight, we usually refer to Ontario legislation because that's uh, uh, our um, sort of comfort zone, I guess. That's where we're from, most of us. The information provided to you tonight is to the best of our ability uh, accurate, but only as of the date of the broadcast. So today is June 24th, Saint-Jean-Baptiste from my friends on in La Belle Province. Uh, and so as the situation changes, usually daily, usually before long weekends, we get announcements. Keep that in mind if you are watching this in a rebroadcast. Also very important to keep in mind that the information we provide today is of general nature and may not necessarily apply to your specific situation. It's important that you seek advice from your professionals, engineers, lawyers, property managers, security advisors, insurance broker. So speak, go get the information that really applies to your situation. Uh, finally, I have to say that this session is being recorded. It's going to be posted later on on Condo Advisor. That's condoadvisor.ca. If you want to see our uh, webinars, past webinars, or this webinar later on, all you need to do is you go to the website. There's a tab at the top corner that says webinar. Click on that, and you'll be able to be redirected to whichever episode you want to see um, uh, to your heart's uh, desire. Okay, what else do I have here? I think we got it all. Very good. 
Uh, let's move on. This is who's on the line and eventually our good uh, second twin will join us. Uh, these are the topics. David, uh, in the absence of your condo twin, can you maybe update us on the, uh, give us the provincial update? For sure. So now, uh, welcome to phase uh, stage two, Toronto and Peel region. I know you've been waiting a very long time to uh, join the rest of us. Uh, congratulations, you are now in stage two. I, I'm sure this will be discussed in great detail throughout the uh, uh, our, our webinar today by management and by lawyers. That does not mean that everything is now open and you can do all the things. It means that you are now able to follow uh, specific uh, health guidelines that are being put out for different businesses to go back to work. Certain businesses are being reopened um, and all physical distancing protocols are still in effect if those business, for businesses that are opening. We will get in much more detail about that, but no, this is not the, um, uh, the, the Ford government telling everyone that we're back to normal. It's stage two, which is not the end of the road. The Windsor-Essex region remains closed um, it, sorry, not closed entirely, but in stage one, uh, I think there's bits and pieces of the region that are, that are, that are opening stage two, but just du double check with your own local um, uh, public health authorities on that. Um, from a, a timing perspective, the declaration of emergency was now uh, again extended today until July 15th. So remember all those counts uh, that Graham has been doing for us on a weekly um, update. You're now counting from the July 15th end of the uh, declaration of emergency. And again, that may or may not be renewed again. Okay, so let's see. Uh, oh, this one was for later. Let me go here. I'll keep that one for in a second here. Um, speaking of the uh, those deadlines, and Denise, you may need to jump in to help me. So what, what we know now is that the emergency period has been extended until July 15th, I think David just said. And so this means that anyone who would have had their AGM up, scheduled to be held up to July 15th, you could either call it now electronically, or if you really wanted, you could postpone it and hold it in person 90, within the 90 days following the period of emergency. So that would bring us, I think, Denise, to November 12th. Uh, and if we look at this, this is the 30 day that's a bit more confusing, but if your, um, if your AGM was scheduled to fall within July 12th to, July, to August 14th, right, the 30 days following the end of the emergency period, rather than have 90 days to call and hold your AGM in person, you have 120 days, right? So that brings us to right. November 12th. Yeah. Now, it doesn't have to be in person, remember? It can be virtually, right? Right. And so that's, I think this is actually, and you're, you're hit it on the head, that's the actual lesson is that uh, regardless, um, you can hold, call and hold your AGM virtually. Uh, and that w whether you have a bylaw right now or not, and that period to do that, that period of exception is the 120 days. So whether you have a bylaw allowing it or not, you can call and hold a virtual AGM and, and vote electronically all the way up to November 12th. Right. right. And also other meetings as well. So requisition meetings, any other meetings that you have can be held virtually without a bylaw up until November 12th. That's right. That's right. Uh, and, and these other meetings that you've just um, identified, Denise, those can't be postponed. Those have to be called within the timeline. Uh, That's the right. one the postponement is for the AGM. OK, so I think we got it. Um, and so let me now go back. Uh, I know that Toronto is, uh, is joining us in phase two. Uh, and so that led uh, Ottawa Public Health to uh, issue a very important warning. So I'm going to bring it here. They're really encouraging everybody to wear their mask. And while uh, they recognize that it's not very fashionable or comfortable, it really is a lot better than wearing a leaf jersey, I guess. And look who loved that <laughs> sense of humor, Catherine Gao, look at that. I did, I'm trying to incite a challenge between Torontonians and Ottawaians. I don't even know how you say that properly um, because it's not gonna be comfortable when it's 40 degrees outside to wear our you know, personal protective equipment, our masks in particular. Um, but, but we fought really hard to, to make progress going forward to enter into phase two and I don't want it to be lost. Um, and I am thinking of the experiences we've had um, very notoriously in Trinity Bellwoods Park and recently at the beaches in Toronto. Anything 
that we can do to uh, encourage folks to do the right and responsible thing uh, all the better. And a lot of times in, in condo land, it's us modeling great behavior. And I'm so pleased to see through the chats um, that folks have certainly got the message, at least all of you who's been attending these regular webinars, uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should and slower is better. So we're going to definitely be um, reinforcing that perspective here tonight again. I'm not sure how you managed to stay within 144 characters on Twitter, uh, Catherine. <laughs> I did have to edit it 13 times, so there's okay, that. Okay, folks. Uh, let's recap. Uh, let's recap the uh, the reopening of the province. Uh, as Catherine said yesterday during our dry run in practice, it's very hard to keep the brakes on, uh, and we're all under increasing pressure to open all the amenities. But owners and directors must understand that the corporation continues to be responsible to control and manage and administer the common elements. And the corporation, that's all of the owners collectively, continue to be the occupiers of common elements. So if something goes wrong, if there's going to be a claim, if somebody's going to complain that the corporation reopened without precautions or reopened prematurely, uh, it's the corporation that's, uh, that's on the hook for that. Uh, people quickly forget that while they really want to open their amenities, they forget that the province continues to have very serious restrictions on, on what business can and can do. And businesses out there are putting in place all sorts of protocols and physical safeguards and all sorts of precautions. We, we, we sort of have to keep that in mind when we're being asked, well, when are you going to reopen the patio? When are you going to reopen the barbecue? When are you going to reopen the rooftop terrace? Um, and, and we're going to post this. The City of Toronto has issued a seven-pager of precautions if you're going to implement, uh, if you're going to reopen your, your Class B pool. We'll post that uh, on Condo Advisor. But all these precautions really apply, in my view, to any amenity that you plan on reopening. So I guess I'm going to first go to you, Jason, and then I'll turn to the two managers. Um, what's the lay of the land? People ask us all the time, like, when can we reopen the amenity? So, Jason, when can we reopen the amenities? What's your sort of take on that? Oh, you're muted, Jason. I'm back. Thank you. So here's my take. Uh, listen, we've, we've constantly said they should not be open as of yet, um, and I'm a firm believer in that to this day. Um, my suggestion would be is that once it's permissible within your community or your area of jurisdiction, once it's permissible, my suggestion is to wait 14 to 21 days. And why? 14 days is that latency period. And then an additional seven days, which works out to be 21. I feel a prudent condominium corporation that manages three or four smaller amenities typically can learn the lessons of the larger facilities that are starting to open those now. And they're really making their own rules. Um, they're coming up with their own best practices. Yes, lots of municipalities have lots of guidelines, but those guidelines are, are different in every municipality. They got the same gist, but as a condo corporation, my suggestion would be to wait 21 days after so that you can see a real verification and understanding of those risks and the impacts after 21 days. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And so on the management ground, let, let me start maybe with Ottawa. Uh, has uh, anything changed and what's being reopened, Sean? What's not being reopened? What's the, what's the pulse out there? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, as you said, we're, we're a little bit ahead of Toronto on the, on the reopening and, and that includes the pressure to, to get things open. With the weather, we've seen a lot of interest in opening patios, rooftop terraces and barbecues. Uh, so far, our recommendation remains uh, open space out, outdoors. We're pretty comfortable with reopening uh, with the proper uh, guidelines, signage, uh, restrictions and capacities. Uh, the pools, we have good guidelines from Ottawa Public Health on how to open and, and what you're required to do to open a pool, including uh, submitting for, uh, to Ottawa Health for permission two weeks ahead of time. Um, the barbecues are a tougher one because uh, our recommendation has, has remained uh, removing any shared items, any furniture, any barbecues, any uh, utensils, anything like that. So really the barbecues are, are still off limits uh, as far as our recommendations go. Um, but uh, but we, we definitely see the pressure on the boards and inevitably in some cases they are, uh, they are giving into that pressure. Um, so all we're doing at this point where, where that's the case is, 
is really tightening up on uh, making sure the cleaning protocols are there, making, making sure any users are fully aware of the restrictions and proper procedures for maintaining distance, limiting numbers, and, uh, and using their own uh, chairs, uh, using their own utensils if they are keeping the barbecues open. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a challenge because nobody has the staff to do proper cleaning and disinfecting. So it's, uh, it's tough to have anything that's actually shared there other than an outdoor space. Right. Uh, and in fact, what you've just described is very much in line with the actual uh, guidance and, and restrictions we get from the province, which basically says that outside amenities are the ones that you may want to consider opening, opening inside amenities, other than the pool, oddly enough, uh, inside amenities at this stage, uh, they shouldn't be open uh, and they're not being open. Uh, the YMCA is not opening and, and Good Life is not opening. Um, and so that's, I think that's the guidance we get. Uh, somebody from the chat line, before I go to you, Catherine, somebody from the chat line called me uh, back to order and made me realize that I forgot to introduce our special guest, Trissa Size from, uh, from Gallagher. And so with a catchy tune, she knows when to take insurance at 200. Never in jeopardy, who is Trisha Size? Hello, Trisha. Thanks for being with us. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being right. here. Sorry, sorry to interject. And just, uh, maybe just on this point before we jump on, I'm seeing some questions in the chat also about, and, and this is something we've been getting many questions about, restaurants are reopening, pools are reopening. Why are condos different? Why can't we do what all of these uh, uh, facilities are doing? So maybe one of the managers wants to jump in and we could all, I could also give a quick legal on that as well. Well, I think the shortest answer, the shortest distance there is what's motivating a really rapid return to business uh, by places like restaurants is the very fact that they're losing money and they're motivated by a restart of the, the economy. So that's a really important factor, a really important function. Uh, one of the things that is completely different in condo land is our access and our ability to staff the requirements in maintaining the physical distancing, the enforcement and the sanitation. Um, and so I think it, it's now been several weeks ago that we talked about primarily the issue or concern being, you know, one, whether or not we believe sanitation is necessary resoundingly, very clearly, um, it is the expectation. Second expectation, Toronto Public Health in particular, and when it comes to things like pools, they're expecting a third party to be sanitizing. That is what their guidance says. That is what their recommendation is. Um, and the third part of it is, um, our business isn't operating a patio, strictly speaking. Our business is operating a condominium safely. And opening the amenity spaces doesn't, strictly speaking, um, facilitate that right now. I wish it did uh, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, but that's kind of my feeling in a nutshell. Sure. Uh, David? Yeah, just, just from the, the legal standpoint on that also, you have to remember the condo is, is considered the corporation, the occupier of the common elements, and you are, the, the condo is liable and responsible for the, uh, the cleaning regimes and the decision making about what's open, what's closed, and what are we following. Uh, and this is, we'll, we'll address it later with, we've already adjusted to about things with waivers and do it at your own risk. Uh, we don't advise that because at the end of the day, the condo corporation is, is the occupier of the common elements and responsible for the health and safety they're in. And as Catherine said, we're, condos are not in the business of running pools or the business of, of running restaurants. They may have these things uh, on the premises as common elements that fall under the framework of the Condo Act anyways. Right. And, and I'll tell you what's my main guidance so far. Uh, there's a piece of legislation in Ontario called the Emergency Management and Civil Protections Act. And it's under that piece of legislation that the province closes things and open up things and puts restrictions. And under this piece of legislation, there's a very important regulation. Uh, for instance, the regulation that tells you, you know, what's the length of that period of the emergency and so on. And it also lists what are the businesses that are essential and what business ought to remain closed. And in my mind, if a gym ought to remain closed at the public level, I can't come up with any sensible reason to open it at the condo level. If it's going to be closed across the street in, in at, at the Good Life or at YMCA where they have the staff and the means and the finances to properly disinfect and clean and control people, if it's going to be closed across the street, there simply isn't any good reason for us to open it 
on our side of the street. That's how I see it. And so when, when pools were reopened at the provincial level, well, then of course that makes sense. So now we know the province allows pools to be reopened. Now we need to ask ourselves, should we reopen, right? Remember, you can always be more restrictive, but not more permissive. And so that approach of a condo court being more restrictive, not more permissive, uh, is the one that should guide you. As long as there's some restrictions out there, you should probably emulate them. You should probably keep those in mind. Uh, Denise, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. No, I, I completely agree with you, Rod. And, and we're recommending to our clients not to open the amenities, the, pool, the pools. And, and keeping those open is a real concern. How are co condominium corporations going to be able to open them safely? Uh, that's a real issue. I mean, even though the public pools may be allowed to be open, we're still taking the position that it's too early. Right, right. Um, Trisha, I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, uh, from the insurance perspective, I guess, uh, maybe things to keep in mind, um, the kind of exposure to the corporation uh, or precautions in the COVID world that, that come to mind. I'll just reiterate uh, what's been said in that we look to the municipality, we look to the uh, we look to the Ministry of Health. We look to all of those governing bodies that help us decide what is and what isn't safe. And as long as you as property managers, as directors are doing your due diligence and acting honestly in good faith on behalf of your, your corporation, then, um, I mean, that's, that's the best you can do. I, I would always recommend, though, that you consult a professional if you are concerned so you call your broker or you you know you, you speak to your legal counsel if there are ever any gray areas and that will certainly help you should there be a lawsuit following uh, a perceived law right 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 and yesterday uh, during our prep talk you were talking about some of the precautions that you thought would be useful you were mentioning uh, posting signs but you were also uh, mentioning that um, not being more open or more adventurous than the province. So really following the public health guidance and not venturing outside of that. Uh, and that has to do with um, how to avoid a claim, I guess, or how to minimize having to pay out for the claim, right? You got it. Uh, I took notes. <laughs> Good listener. <laughs> I took notes, right? I'm gonna say this, if I'm retained by someone and I'm cross-examining a condo corp, and you've reopened your gym before the province allowed it to reopen, I, I would ask you exactly that. What made you think that you could reopen your gym before the YMCA? What, what possessed you to do that is really the question. Okay, anyways, we sort of got off track here. Let's see if we can uh, return to uh, what we're talking about. Um, with respect to um, opening amenities, I'm not sure, uh, Catherine, if you wanna maybe tackle that. You're the one who sent me this wonderful seven pages from, from Toronto. Uh, tell us about that a bit, you're muted. Yeah, and it is terrific. Um, not only because Toronto is the center of the universe, I know it not to be, but one of the things that I was pleased to see in Toronto's guidance is. Uh, oh, we're losing precise, you. How precise they were being in terms of uh, what they felt was necessary. What I think was most important um, was how specific they were in terms of what they viewed to be a requirement for reopening a pool um, and the guidance that was therefore instituted. So it's been very clear in affording good direction to people who are contemplating opening their pools in condo land. And I think it's a great piece of documentation upon which boards can rely when they say, it's not that we don't want to, it's not that we're making up these requirements. It's not that we don't trust that you might even sanitize between yourselves. It's not that we don't believe you won't self screen. It is that we are following the guidance that is issued by public health and we're taking it very seriously. This document also gives, in my opinion, some really strong indicators as to what is and should be expected on other outdoor areas uh, in terms of visual, visual cues and being able to, um, as Sean had mentioned previously, ensure that there aren't additional folks gathering. Um, and so even if you don't have your condominium corporation in Toronto, I think taking guidance from a document that is quite specific here and clearly is, is thinking of condominiums 
as well as public facilities, um, I think it offers you a really good backbone for how you put together your plan for reopening. And again, every condominium corporation in Ontario is to have their own plan for reopening. So consider it well uh, and, and in detail. The other thing, the way it was phrased by, by one person uh, was to be cutting edge, but not bleeding edge. So we, they didn't want to to, to suffer um, the slings and arrows of, of doing it incorrectly. So further to Jason's point, if you were to wait uh, you know, 21 days, not only are you waiting out the period of additional transmissions, uh, the other thing that you're waiting out is learning and finding out some, some best practices, right? We can then visit the YMCA and see how they do it and how they can affect it appropriately. And that might be the best way for us to, to implement at the condo level as well. Right. I, I do think, and we'll post this uh, this uh, directive, I do think that condo corps should have a look at that and should sort of um, see what they can implement from it, not just for the pools, but I'll give you an example. It's it's interesting that they're actually recommending that, uh, that you screen staff and bathers and spectators um, and that you ensure that they don't have any other symptoms. And in fact, uh, they're recommending that you screen them on the way in and on the way out. And most importantly, and I think this is going to bring a smile to, uh, or to uh, Jason's face, maybe a tear to his eye. They, they're expecting or they're recommending that you maintain a log uh, uh, of who attended and who was there and have their contact information. Why would that be, uh, Jason? Well, that's so that public health can reach back out to the condo corporation and say somebody's been tested positive, and then they're going to be asking the condo corporation for the documentation uh, of screening processes, who was in that pool, what day, what time, who else registered before and after, because they want to start to make sure that they're doing that contact tracing. So it's not as just as simple as Catherine, you know, Catherine's really pointed out, it's not as simple as just opening up the amenity. You need staffing, you need resources, you need documentation. So as an example, to put an amenity open that will serve 20 to 24 people a day, let's say, um, you're taking on all this additional workload that has in itself additional risk and exposures and opportunities for gaps. So yeah, it's going to be tough. Right. And when you do uh, upload our presentation from the condoadvisor.ca's website, you'll see that I've, I've summarized it here as well. Okay, we're running out of time. Right, we need to, Bob, I was going to say we need to clarify. We don't need to clarify. We need to repeat what we've said last week about waivers because, I mean, some people are um, saying, oh, well, gee, they talked about a waiver last week. That must mean that there should be a waiver. And, and in fact, at this stage, what's our recommendation with respect to waivers, Denise? Well, you know, I'm glad you brought this up, Rod, because I've had people contact me saying, I heard on Condo Advisor, you and Rod are recommending waivers. And I'm like, are they listening to the same webinar? I'm just amazed by this. So I want to make it clear, no waivers. Don't open your amenities if you feel like you need to have a waiver. I just want to explain, you know, waivers, are they really enforceable? I don't think they are for this kind of thing. We generally see waivers where a unit owner wants to give their keys to somebody and have the concierge ha hand it over to them or a personal trainer, those are the circumstances. Items that aren't within the corporation's obligation to do, then you get waivers. But something like right. opening the, when, the amenities where it's the duty of the condominium corporations to ensure that they're safe, getting owners to sign waivers is not gonna help in terms of any liability. And you tell me, if an owner says, I'm not gonna sign the waiver, I'm using the gym anyway, what are you gonna do? I think having lawyers prepare waivers for amenities is just going to cause more legal work. And I'm going to save you legal fees by telling you not to do the waiver. Right. The, one thing is to seek a waiver from someone when they're undertaking a risky activity sort of outside of the ordinary sort of business or obligation of the corporation. That's one thing. But I mean, just imagine this, a restaurant that would have you sign a waiver when you come in to ho order a hot dog. I mean, it just makes no sense. I mean, if you don't trust your hot dogs, like you shouldn't be in that business. So I think the same applies to, to condo corps. Okay. Um, 
let's uh, move on because we actually, this was sort of a recap from last week. Uh, and I'd like to turn to Tricia because uh, we had you come here to tell us about how insurance works uh, in condos. So let me turn the mic to you. Uh, and give us a bit of a, um, we because we try to have like sort of two themes now, one COVID related, one not so. And so, Trisha, help us understand how the insurance uh, uh, scheme works in the condo world. Okay, well, here's, I, I've given you a little bit of a, a picture, which pretty much just sets out that we've got what the unit owner is responsible for with respect to insurance. So there's actually two responsibilities here. You need a unit policy, and you need a corporation policy. So the unit owner pays into both of these, one being just for its own unit and the other being collective for the, for the corporation in general. So I've just split out here what the condo is responsible for at the bottom, you know, the common elements, liability, boiler machinery, also known as equipment breakdown, DNO coverage, and then cyber, whether or not that's pertinent to your unit or to your condo or not. And then the unit policy will be for any betterments or improvements above the standard unit content. If it's not fixed to the wall, then it's considered a content. Additional living expenses, you want to make sure that you have something outside, you have a place to stay outside of your unit should there be a loss and you need to, to vacate for whatever amount of time. Condo will definitely not cover that. That's not part of the condo's policy. Deductibles, depending on what deductibles are with respect to property damage, water damage, uh, you want to make sure that if that is ultimately your unit, unit's responsibility that you've got coverage for it under your unit owner policy. And then personal liability, that comes with any policy. It's got a, um, a personal liability on there, li line on there as well. So the first top uh, five boxes is really what would fall under a unit owner's personal uh, insurance. And the bottom five, I think, is what the corporation has to have. And there's a reason why we're talking about that, because that's going to bring us to, uh, Denise is going to talk about how to, uh, is going to talk about the insurance deductible bylaws. I'm going to talk about standard unit bylaws. Uh, and and let's see, next slide for you, um, Tricia. Sure. So the question was what's affecting condo, condo's premiums and their deductibles, and there's a number of things. It's not one quick answer. Very, very obviously property and liability claims. Uh, insurance is too often seen these days as a maintenance plan uh, rather than an emergency option or a last resort. Um, you may have heard that the saying that water is the new fire. The more claims are being made due to water losses in multi-residential dwellings than ever before. And we're becoming more of a litigious society every day. And as a result, we're seeing more claims against condos for negligence. So as an example, I slipped and fell on the condo property and it's the corporation's fault. So more and more claims are, are affecting the premiums, making premiums and deductibles go up. Social inflation related to um, related to liability claims, rising cost of insurance claims as a result of societal trends and broader definitions of liability. We're, we're seeing claims that are bigger and therefore people believe that they are, they are more entitled to larger sums. Uh, Mother Nature, we're getting that 100-year storm almost every year at some point somewhere in Canada. And storms are, these are storms are buildings that our buildings and infrastructure just isn't capable of handling that frequently. So we're seeing higher, higher claims, more costly claims. We have more free thaw cycles than we had before. It's an issue with both slip and fall issues as well as ice damming claims. So, so Mother Nature's not been insurance, uh, the insurance um, industry's friend by any means. Right. So um, we did a survey yeah. on Condo Advisor a while back, and the survey, one of the question was, in the past two years, how has your corporation's insurance premium changed? And there's 67% of the, uh, those answering it responded that it has gone up by a lot. Uh, is that like sort of a trend? Is that here to stay? Like, where, where, where's, where's the market going here? Well... As noted there on the slide, it's, we've had historically low rates for a very long time. And this, this hard market has really, really made it, um, made it even more of an important time for rates to be boosted. So there's lots of reasons why rates are going up, as, as we've seen. 
But depending on who you speak to, you'll hear that we're currently in a hard market, meaning there's higher demand for insurance and a decreased decrease supply of, of coverages. So insurance companies are making it more difficult to obtain insurance and they're making more hoops to jump through and increasing premiums when they do write that coverage. More and more markets um, or markets or insurance companies are choosing to stop writing this type of business altogether or substantially limiting their capacity. So if, if they were normally, or, or say five years ago, they were willing to write $20 million capacity on a property, they're, they're not willing to write that necessarily anymore. They're only willing to write $5 million worth of that, that property. And we're seeing a lot of subscription policies or policies with more than one carrier on them. Um, so ultimately, it's, it's harder to obtain insurance. And when you do obtain it, it's more expensive. It's been happening over the last, I'm going to say, two years. I don't see it, it, it softening anytime soon. I'm going to say we're, we, we're in this for the long haul. I'm looking at, I, I'm seeing it, and I'm, I have not been in this industry for 25 years, but I'm seeing it as headed in the same direction for at least another year, if not more. Okay. I see a lot of questions, actually, on the chat channel about, about insurance. So h how do we keep our premium low? Um, we avoid claims as much as possible. As a broker, I talk a lot about self-insuring. And what I mean is, if the loss is below a certain threshold, do not look to the corporation's policy to pay for it. So in today's market, if the loss is not at least double the insurance or the insurance deductible amount, then don't make a claim. And I, I hear so many clients, I hear so many corporations and boards frustrated to hear that. But unfortunately, that is, in fact, the market that we're in right now. Um, there's some debate as to whether condo corporations should include a line item in their budgeting for planning ahead for some of these losses so they don't need to go through insurance to pay for them. With a reserve fund, you prepare for major repairs and replacements, so it's, it's wise to also prepare for those situations that you can't see coming. Um, how else we can learn? You can learn from losses. If you've had a number of, of claims that have happened that are similar, you see a trend, it's important to look at why those are happening and see how you can deter them from happening in future or mitigate them from happening or mitigate the damages as a result of them. Um, risk management. <laughs> Risk management is important to take regular inspections of the property, COVID or not. I mean, even with COVID, we still have to make sure that we're doing these maintenance inspections. We're taking into account what we see, we're noting it, and we're, we're putting procedures in place or making repairs to those things that, are, that need them in order to, to deter risk. Um, and consider a standard unit bylaw or remove finishes from your standard unit bylaw. Um, we're going to talk more about that coming up and then educate the owners. Anytime you put communication out to the owners, just if there's anything, any concerns that you might have, um, any ideas of how to keep the property safe, asking for feedback from them as to, is there anything that you see that is unsafe or a maintenance issue that should be repaired I, I, in the event of a, in the event of a claim, it's possible that, you know, the corporation is going to be, questioned as to what do you do on a regular basis to keep your people and your residents safe and visitors to the property. And this is all documentation. Uh, Jason can speak to that. This is all documentation that you have, in fact, um, done your due diligence. You've reached out to the owners, et cetera. Right, 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 right. Uh, this is music to uh, Jason's ears, that's for sure. Okay, let's <laughs> see. Um, so, and then we've covered that already. Uh, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna switch gears a bit because I see time flying by. So we know that premiums are going up. We know that deductibles are going up. We know that the 100 year uh, storm is now a yearly event or so. And so there's two ways to try to uh, help your insurance history and to try to protect the corporation from these future increases. And one of the tools is the insurance deductible bylaw, and Denise will talk about that. And the other tool is the standard unit bylaw. So, uh, Denise, do you want to walk us through yeah. the deductible bylaw? Sure. Um, I mean, what we're recommending to condominium corporations is they try to get a higher deductible. Um, and that's important for the purposes of this insurance deductible bylaw. Uh, the first thing you want to check, because a lot of corporations may not be aware of this, they may already have an insurance deductible provision in, the, in a bylaw. 
So let's start from the beginning. We've got the Condominium Act. And with or without a bylaw, if an owner causes damage to their unit and it's an act or omission of that unit owner, which Rod, you have on the slides here, if it's their fault and if it's within the unit, you don't need a bylaw. So the Condominium Act says that that owner is responsible for the deductible. So damage to the unit, uh, maybe your deductible is 25,000, that owner is responsible. If that unit owner causes damage to another unit or the common elements, or if there's damage to the unit and it's not their fault, that's when you need this bylaw. So we, we recommend that you check your general operating bylaw. If it's not there, then you do a separate bylaw to ensure that if that unit owner would be responsible for the deductible if they cause damage to another unit or the common elements, or there's damage in their unit and it wasn't their fault. Uh, so the, those are the, that's what you would put in the, in right. the insurance deductible bylaw. I guess if we dig even a, a step further back, so the deductible uh, is that first portion that's not going to be paid by the insurer, right? And as you said, Denise, it could be, well, it could be 5000 but it could easily be $25,000, and it could be more than that. Actually, we've heard stories in Toronto of deductibles over a hundred and over $200,000. And so that's the portion that the insurer will not pay when there's a claim made against the corporation's policy. And so who pays that? That's the question. If, if, if there's going to be damage to a unit and the first $25,000 is not going to be paid by the insurer, well, then the corporation has really just a few options. One of them is you turn to all the owners and you ask them to cough up $25,000 to cover that deductible if that's the deductible. And if you don't have that, well, you know, either you have a deficit or you have to special assess. And that's every time there's a claim. And so the bylaw, Denise, you're talking about is, is how to be able to fairly uh, turn the deductible responsibility to an owner, right? That's right. And that owner could get their own insurance coverage under the unit owner policy to cover that deductible in the event that they have to pay. And that's something that we recommend you advise owners of in terms of getting their own insurance in place. Right. Exactly. So an, a, an owner would be able, if, if properly insured, would be able to turn to their own insurer to cover that deductible. Right. Exactly. Like, perfect. I was going to say any questions, but uh, I see the questions are flaring up. Let me just see here. A uh, different tool now is the standard unit bylaw. And this one is the interesting one. So you have to keep in mind as the starting point, unless you adopt a bylaw, uh, the corporation is responsible to uh, repair units after damage, right? And that has always puzzled me. Certainly the owner is responsible to maintain the unit. The corporation is responsible to maintain the corporation, the common element, but the corporation, unless you adopt a bylaw, uh, is responsible to repair a unit after damage up to the standard unit. Anything that's above the standard unit, you could have owners insure and repair it themselves. And that's the purpose of this bylaw is to define what are you going to put in that standard unit. Um, and now naturally there is a wide variety here. So if you include everything in the standard unit, everything that the um, developer uh, sold you, that is more expensive to repair if there's damage, right? At, on the other end of the spectrum, if you remove everything from the standard unit, meaning that the owner is responsible to repair everything after damage, the less you have in the standard unit, the less expensive it is to repair uh, after an insurable event. So the corporation has to decide What's, what's the level of comfort here? Do you want to include everything and therefore face the risk of increased premium and more expensive repairs? Do you want to exclude everything and minimize the risk of the corporation? Or do you want to go for a middle ground and you just remove the expensive finishes such as flooring or cabinetry and so on? So um, what has become more and more popular and, and, and Denise may, may after that sort of give us a, more of a Toronto sort of perspective on that. But what is becoming more and more popular is to remove everything from the unit. And by that, I mean to have owners ensure what they own, right? And so if the standard unit is the concrete box, and if you're always going to give your owners access to 
to, to, to water, to electricity, to heat, to AC, and so on. You give them access to all the common services, but everything that's inside, everything that, own, that an owner owns, the floor, the cabinetry, the countertop, everything, if, if you turn that to the owner, it sort of makes sense for them to ensure that they own it, they selected it, they wanted the expensive finishes. Why would I uh, be paying extra to ensure that if, if, I, if that's not my lifestyle, right? And so that's called the um, bare bones, or as we call it here, the bare box. Uh, and if, if your standard unit is the bare box, uh, that's what the corporation will ensure. It will ensure the structure. It will ensure that you always have a place to put the unit, but all everything you fancy in your unit, all the expensive finishes, uh, marble from antique Greece and those wonderful woods from a distant country. Uh, well, that's, that's great. It looks amazing. Repair it and insure it yourself. Like, not me, don't put it on me kind of thing. So what would be the benefits of that would be, it would reduce the collective insurance costs or maybe more accurately, it would flatline it going forward. It would help keep the uh, premium down because now the corporation does not have to insure all these expensive finishes. And, and, and it would be more equitable to owners if you went with such a bare bone or bare box uh, uh, standard unit, it'd be more equitable to owners because as I said, why am I paying for your life choices, right? Um, and it would put the onus on owners to be more careful in most cases. If you know that you're on the hook for your own unit, well, maybe you'll be more careful. Maybe you're not going to flush rice down the toilet. Maybe you're not going to turn on the taps and go for a walk. Um, and also, in our experience, it reduces disputes between insurers and owners, because obviously, if the water comes from the unit above and damages the unit below, you suddenly have three insurers around the table. The insurer from above saying, well, that's not my fault. We don't cover this. The insurer from below saying, well, it was your water. We don't cover that. And the insurance from the corporation that would come in and say, well, yeah, we cover this. We don't cover that. Um, and so by having a, a standard unit, which places on each owner the responsibility to repair their unit after damage, it streamlines the repair process process. And what's interesting is that most owners are already insured for that. And if they're not insured, it's not very costly for them to have their unit insured. And so what we did last time I spoke about that last week, um, we sort of, and this, these are just examples, but we basically went around the, uh, the corporation. And we asked people to tell us what what, uh, who is their personal insurer and how, what's their coverage and what, what it costs to cover. And so you'll see, and again, these examples are just examples, but you'll see that on the first line, improvement and betterments, all of these insurers were all already providing uh, um, coverage. Right now, obviously, you know, economical in this example provided more. Intact was at 500,000, Desjardins at 344. And, you know, if you go down the line, and so each owner gets to pick the level of insurance they want to repair their units. And you can see at the bottom, the cost isn't prohibitive, the cost for each owners. I know it may sound like witchcraft to you, what we're talking about and, and like, oh my goodness, what are you talking about? But that's how every home in Ontario is insured. Like this is not novel, what, what's being presented here. Um, maybe I'll turn to you quickly, Denise, and then after that to the managers. What's what's your experience uh, in, in Toronto uh, with respect to the actual bare bone? I think it's less popular over there. Well, I don't know if it's Toronto or generally our, our firm. So, you know, the past few years, we've been doing standard unit bylaws and taking out the countertops and the flooring because that's where most of the claims were. Uh, we weren't really going beyond that. But, you know, after seeing what's happened with the insurance rates and difficulty in getting insurance and even just our discussion yesterday, I think we're going to recommend going the bare bones route. Um, and something else to keep in mind, and I see that Michael Clifton said something in the chat, um, we're going to have changes to the act. Um, and we're, going, we're anticipating that there will be a standard unit schedule or a, or a bylaw. So, you know, do we wait till then or do we just do our own standard unit bylaws for now and then see what happens later? Right, right. I guess, I guess we'll, time will tell how much the province will break uh, that section of the act when they get to it. Uh, um, Sean, what's your experience uh, in the Ottawa market? Are these sort of uh, common? Are they being adopted? What's... Yeah, it's it's uh, much like Denise said. You know, we 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 had seen the standard unit uh, definition gradually getting stricter and stricter, taking out countertops, taking out flooring, because those were the high risk items. Uh, but now we're seeing uh, it's not enough. Uh, the claims are still escalating, uh, as Tricia said, 
water is the new fire. Uh, we need to manage claims. And the only way we can do that is to reduce the likelihood or the, the types of incidents that are going to result in a claim. Uh, and that's to get down to that bare box. So right. we are seeing more and more of the, of the bare box uh, definitions. We'd always been a little agnostic on it, I think, uh, until the last year and a half when we saw the, the, uh, the, the tightening of the market or the hardening of the market. And with premiums, uh, you know, I had a, a momentary glimpse of hope when I saw one of our clients had a, a renewal with a 10% premium increase last month. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, yesterday, we had one with a 100% increase in the premium with no claims over the last year. Uh, so it's not getting any better. And, uh, and obviously, you know, we're seeing a, a huge increase in the claims that are going to be coming. So it's just going to get tighter and tighter, I think. So whatever we can do to manage claims, I think we have to do. Right. And Trisha, the benefits for a condo corp uh, in your neck of the woods uh, to adopting these, what do you see? I see, I see that we've got, I mean, we've got a lot of them in already. Most, I mean, say most condos have them. If not, if they're not already in place, they're trying to get them in place. Um, I see that we've got similar between bare bones, uh, kind of a middle ground between bare bones and a full unit. Um, what exactly did you want to know, Rod? Sorry, right. well, so I'm, answering, we... I'm answering questions on the on the panel on the. Oh, <laughs> it's Matt. That's great. Uh, <laughs> do you do you foresee? I guess is that helpful to keep the premiums low? I I, I don't expect premiums do. to go down as a result of it, but I do expect the premiums to be flatline going forward. Is that sort of your experience? I do. I do see that as as my experience. The less you have in, included in your standard unit, the less the condo is responsible to insure and therefore repair in the event of a claim. So if there are claims, they're going to be far less expensive, and therefore the claims history isn't going to the con, uh, the insurer isn't going to be paying out quite as much money, and therefore the premiums don't have to go up, or there's no claim surcharge as as we call it. Um, Absolutely. I, I see that it's not, it's, it's, a, it's not a, a quick fix. It's kind of a long game. It's, it's the long game to get, to save the money down the road rather than quickly snap your fingers, get a standard unit bylaw in place or, or bare bones bylaw in place, and then suddenly your premiums drop. I don't, I don't see that happening. Right. Rod, I'm seeing a question in the chat that's coming up from in, in a few different ways uh, on this exact topic. How, how bare bones or bare box can you make a bare box um, bylaw? Because people are saying, can we just exclude everything? Uh, what does the Condo Act say on that? Right. So what the Condo Act says, and Denise, if I misspeak, jump in. But the Condo Act basically says that uh, by, with a bylaw, you can define what's the standard, uh, the standard unit. Certainly, our bare box model in its strictest uh, version excludes exactly that, everything. And so the flooring, the walls, the, um, the cabinetry, the counters, the sinks, everything but always promises to provide the structure the concrete box concrete walls concrete floor and a connection to all the um, common services that's the that's the like the, the purest bare box um, version of a standard unit and if the owners are prepared to adopt such a bylaw then and they do. I mean, I've had one adopted last week again, and, and one the week before that. If when you explain it properly to owners, they see the benefit. Owners have to view this not as an owner. When you look at your insurance regime and scheme in your co corporation, when you look at whether to adopt this bylaw, don't view this as an owner. Put your investor's cap. The investor's cap would say, which corporation do I want to invest in? Which is the one that has the lowest risk to the corporation? Which one has the lowest risk of seeing a claim result in our premium explode? Because I mean, we've seen that uh, where premiums went from 20,000 to 75,000 to 110,000. So just do the math. The difference between 20,000 and 100,000, it's 80 extra thousand dollars that you'll have to pay if you need to turn to the corporation when there's damage to a unit, right? Or, or to multiple units. So the bare bone unit is exactly that. There's nothing included in it. Now, you need to always ensure, and I think that was your caution, Denise, uh, yesterday, 
whatever is out, whatever is a common element has to continue to be provided. I mean, we're only changing the definition of what falls within the unit. The corporation, I guess, then is, is always going to be responsible for the common elements. That's obviously. right. And that's why Schedule C is the first place to look to see what the boundaries of the unit is. And then once you have that, you can determine the standard unit bylaw. Right, exactly. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. We're running out of time, folks. I mean, this is this is the final episode of the season, and uh, I wish we could keep going for a long time, but um, I have a supper to go to. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> folks. So, uh, any other questions, uh, uh, David, that you saw on, that's worth uh, having a look at? Well, we're pretty much spot there. There are a lot of a lot of questions. I've been trying to jump in with uh, ones that are relevant as we're going. Right. Um, uh I'm glad to see that Michael uh, says that this has been, the bear box has been in place pretty much for, uh, since 2001 as, as standard practice. Because I remember when I started to talk about that here in Ottawa, people really thought that I was a bit insane or very radical. Imagine this, asking owners to ensure what they own. Oh my goodness. Anyways. You know, look, Rod, I just wanted yeah. to say something. We were doing that uh, bare bones, but only for commercial units back right. in 2001. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. At the end of the day, folks, uh, the bylaw is always submitted to a vote of the owners. And it's all a question of educating the owners and presenting what is in their best interest and trying to convince them and get them to understand it is in their best interest. But at the end of the day, owners will get to vote and you need 50% of all registered units, of all units, to vote in favor of it if you're going to uh, adopt it. Okay, folks, it's almost six o'clock. Uh, so it's time to, uh, to bring this uh, episode to a close. Um, I'm going to go around the table. I'm going to thank my panelists as usual uh, and maybe ask them for a piece of advice for the summer. Uh, Sean Cornish from Apollo Property Management, thank you so much. I mean, you've been with us for quite a few episodes now. Any uh, piece of advice for the summer? Uh, well, I, my, I'd start without a comment. I'm disappointed. I was expecting a two hour season finale, so I didn't expect to be finishing quite so soon. Uh, but uh, advice? Uh, I have I have the uh, the pleasure or the uh, the difficulty of straddling two provinces, and it's kind of interesting seeing how things are being done in Quebec and how they're being done in Ontario. I received a, an invitation yesterday to play squash uh, from uh, somebody I, I know in Quebec, uh, and visited a restaurant to see how they're uh, using their COVID protocols. Uh, Catherine nailed it when she was saying, "We're not in the business of amenities. We're in the business of condos." And uh, we should not be taking our cues uh, directly from the the public sector or the private sector and how they're doing things because they they have a profit motive, uh, and we very clearly do not in the condos. We need to worry about the health and safety of our owners and residents, and uh, and that should drive what we do. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Catherine Gao from uh, Crossbridge speaking on behalf of ACMO in 144 characters. <laughs> Advice for the summer. <laughs> I can't make my lips do only 144 characters. Uh, my advice for the summer, and I, I do want to thank you, Rod, for putting this panel together. It has been uh, really terrific for me as an opportunity to uh, crystallize a lot of my thinking um, surrounding COVID. And I think it is part of what I would recommend to everybody through the summer. Uh, take as many examples as possible from um, you know, your property manager, from neighboring communities, uh, from commercial outfits in order to make your plan and uh, communicate it well and frequently. The other thing is if you communicate what you're thinking about before you actually implement it, not only will you gain buy-in from all of your homeowners, you might get a great idea from them that you can use and implement. Um, so keep the communication flowing. The, the plan will not be perfect no matter how much thought goes into it, no matter how much research, and it will constantly change. So be open to that as well. Very good, thank you so very much. Uh, still going around the table. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, uh, Denise Lash from Lash Condo Law. I can't thank you enough for all your guidance, for all your advice, for all the time you've put into this. Uh, for having uh, taught me to blog and for pretty much having uh, set me on the condo law path. Thank you very Basically much. Basically unleashing him on the world. Well, yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, Rod, you've done uh, an amazing job um, taking on this leadership role, bringing all the various organizations together. 
and I want to thank you for that. I am getting constant um, compliments from clients and others who are just saying, you know, Condo Advisor is a really special, a special uh, evening. Uh, you know, they enjoy it. And Rod, especially you. Um, but my closing comments, summer or not, is no waivers. And you're not going to, you know, this isn't a popularity contest. So board members, don't worry about opening the amenities. As lawyers, we want to protect you. And we're, we're doing that by telling you not to open the amenities. Not yet. And listen to Jason's advice. I like the 21-day period. Wait till others open up the amenities. Wait the 21 days. If no one gets COVID, then think about taking those steps. <clears throat> Right, absolutely. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Graham McPherson of Galling WLG. Parting words, buddy? Well, I, I've, I've kind of rolled into this uh, season finale like the class clown at the end of a school <laughs> right before the summer vacation. You know, I crack a few jokes and show up late. And uh, so uh, I, I'd just like to thank all of the, uh, everyone who has been tuning in so often to see us. Uh, thank you very much for that. It, it's been an absolute pleasure doing this. Um, my advice for the summer is, you know, keep staying safe, stay informed. And, um, and keep doing all the hard work you've been doing that's, that's hopefully getting us out of the woods. Thank you so much. Uh, David Plotkin of Galling WLG. Uh, parting words, buddy? Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to thank everyone also. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been a tremendous amount of fun doing this every week. It, it requires me to uh, brush up constantly on all of the, the moving parts and the, the changing uh, directions coming out of uh, government. Uh, it, and it's allowed me the opportunity to interact with a lot of you, the viewers, um, through the chat and, and through these webinars. But also, it's great to be getting emails now from uh, from, from former clients, from uh, current clients, from new clients, uh, just making mention of, of our webinars and how much we've all enjoyed it. Um, so my advice for the summer is that we're all still here. We all still exist. We're also doing our jobs. We're just not doing the webinar. So please do feel free to reach out to us if you need our assistance. Um, and and enjoy uh, enjoy the weather and uh, enjoy your summers. Wonderful, thank you so much, David. Uh, Jason Reed of the National Life Safety Group. You've been with us pretty much, I think, from the beginning. Always the voice of reason. Uh, thanks so much. I, I can't thank you enough uh, uh, as well. I mean, you've provided all sorts of free templates uh, to to our to our viewers. Thank very much for that. Parting words, uh, Jason. Rod, and, and thank you. I'm just privileged to be alongside here. This has been a real mental health thing for me. So I participate on a different sector or industry webinar three, four times a week. Uh, Wednesday and Tuesday nights are the condo industry. Um, and uh, it, it's amazing to see um, the passion and the dedication and the turnout to these events and, and what everybody on these calls have done to, to better their communities. Uh, you've risen uh, above other industries that I will not name. And uh, that's impressive. Okay, thank you so very much. Trisha Size of Gallagher Insurance Broker. You've been with us twice. Thank you uh, again. You did all the heavy lifting today. Any um, words of wisdom uh, before uh, we go and before the door behind you gets opened by the kids waiting for supper, I, th I assume? <laughs> Um, I just, yeah, thanks. I just want to say thanks for having me. Um, you're a great group. It's a great group to work with. And um, I enjoy answering the questions. Sorry, I get a little lost. There's a lot going on, Rod. I don't really know how you do what you do. So well done. Um, and my advice is just, as, as all of these people sit in front of you on this webinar, as David said, if you don't know, just ask, reach out. We all are here. We're doing this. This is what we do. This is what we love. So please ask the questions and just and just make sure you're you're getting the answers before you make a move. Thanks, right. guys. Thank you. Well, folks, this was this was a lot of fun. It all started on a dark and cold Tuesday night on March 17th, and we hesitantly launched our first webinar on March 18th. And since then, week after week, we've had this amazing panel of ex experts. You, have, you know, you've just heard them again. Can't thank them enough for what they've done. It's a lot of work to put these together, but they're a lot of fun to put together. And I'd like to sort of uh, uh, make a special mention to two directors who have registered from the very beginning. They haven't missed an episode yet. We have uh, Ross uh, Glasgow, uh, director in Ottawa. In fact, I know exactly where he lives because he lives across the street from me. And Rick van der Berg, another director from Ottawa. Honorable mentions to uh, people that actually did attend uh, 14 webinars, Brian uh, Burney, uh, director, and David Dever. 
another director. And I mean, there's tons more, but I mean, these people have, uh, you know, they're frequent flyers. So thanks so much for your trust. Thanks so much for uh, being with us week after week. We'll continue to monitor the situation and we will continue to blog about, about condo law. I mean, um, two great blogs to follow, of course, Condo Advisor, if you so desire, but also uh, Denise Slash has a great blog of her own. Um, and so uh, we will continue to blog on these things. We'll continue to bring you updates and we'll keep our eyes open. I mean, if there's an update, usually the province seems to uh, unleash updates before a long weekend. So if anything like that happens, if we, if we need to call you back uh, uh, to our uh, living room here, we'll do that for sure. But otherwise, I think barring any unforeseen event, uh, we're probably gonna see you uh, on the other side of this summer. I think that's where this is going. So people, uh, thank you again. Thanks for your trust. Thanks for being with us. Be safe, be healthy, and be good to one another.